I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. So I've got Simon Rich with me again. Simon, how's it going? Going good. Thanks so much for having me back. Simon, I'm super excited, but I want to know how you're feeling. Your your TV show that you wrote, uh, Man Seeking Woman, is coming out tonight. The first show is tonight uh, on, on FXX. Uh, what time? 10 p.m.? Uh, 10.30. 10.30 Eastern. 10.30. They, they really are pushing you back there. This is They're, they're, they're making it challenging for you. But how do you well, feel? 10.30, are you- 10.30 Eastern is like two hours ahead of, of like where my sketches usually were at, on SNL. So I feel like I've broken my record. Right. So you're, you're moving further and further down the, uh, closer, the clock. Closer to like a, an hour when people would be awake. You, you might end up writing sketches for General Hospital soon. That's the goal. That's someday. <laughs> um, so what, what are you feeling like right now? Like, are you nervous? The, the pilots tonight? Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm super nervous. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's incredibly surreal to think it's actually going to be on TV. I still can't believe they they let us uh, make this show. Uh, I keep at every at every stage of the creative process, I felt like I was being pranked by FXX. Like, like, like I, I keep expecting them to call and be like, "We're not going to make this crazy show," you know. Well, okay. Uh, what 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 was the most anxious moment in making the show so obviously you spent some months writing it then you sent so, and uh, just to mention it it stars jay baruchel who i recently saw in this is the end where he was hilarious it also is based off your book of short uh stories the last girlfriend on earth yeah it's uh it's a uh, yeah it's a show called man seeking woman and it's um uh a surreal sitcom so it's it's pretty simple and it's conceit it's just a, a guy jay baruchel trying to meet women but um it's full of supernatural elements so there you know there's things like time travel and sex aliens and various forms of monsters and, and creatures uh but despite all those complications it's really just about a, a guy looking for love yeah no i like the combination of there's this overall arc, like you say, this guy's looking for love. And then, you know, FXX has really been kind of like the place for comedy sitcoms in the past few years. You have The League, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Louie, of course, and now your show. Like, it's, you have, you have a, a really good, uh, 
you know, cohort of other shows you're going up against there with FXX or, or teaming with. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been just shocked from the get go at how much creative freedom they've, they've given us. Uh, I haven't had this much leeway, you know, in my entire life outside of the pages of a book or, you know, or the, or the New Yorker. They just, uh, you know, in the pilot, uh, not to give too much away, but, you know, he finds out that his ex girlfriend is dating Adolf Hitler, who, yeah. uh, we learned, we learned has faked his own death and is, a, you know, 130 years old or so. And so we've got, you know, Bill Hader as a 130 year old Hitler rolling around in a motorized wheelchair. Uh, and we never had, you know, any kind of resistance over that. You know, we have, we have, uh, multiple decapitations. We've got, uh, you know, Jay is constantly getting dismembered and set on fire. Uh, FXX has never once blinked. They, uh, they've, they, they said, you know, go for it. Uh, and uh, at every every step of the way, so, so I guess what I'm saying is if the show doesn't work, it's entirely my fault. <laughs> it's not FXX's fault. They haven't uh, gotten in our way. Uh, it's it's really it's it's been the most creatively fulfilling year of my life. I feel super lucky that I got to do this thing. Yeah, and let's let's summarize this past year. You you had uh, the books Ball Brats came out. I don't know. Um, did you have any other books come out this year specifically? Um, I don't think so. I think it was just that one. And, uh, so you worked on this show and also, um, you, you, you started or, or sold the rights to two, two movies, one for Elliot Allagash and, um, and one for the, the story in Spoiled Brats, which was based on you and your great grandfather. Oh yeah. Sell out. Yeah. I'm doing that over with, uh, with Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. That's been Super fun. We're working on that right now. Uh, can I just say this is like this is like part two of James being envious of Simon Rich. Like you get to work on this movie with Seth Rogen while meantime you're doing a TV show on on FXX. Like what what stresses you out? Like what 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 has caused anxiety in this past year? Oh man, you know it's it's like uh, I, I'm really fortunate to work with a lot of super talented people. Uh, my writer's room on the show it, it includes uh, Ian Maxstone Graham, who's been on The Simpsons for almost two decades. I've got Robert Padnick from The Office. I have Sofia Alvarez, who's this brilliant New York playwright. And Dan Merck, this uh, longtime Onion writer. So I'm surrounded by like extremely funny, hardworking, talented people uh, at all hours of the day. So the only thing that stresses me out is trying to keep up with everybody. You know, I just want to make sure that. Uh, I'm doing good work because um, everyone really inspires me, and and I wanna I wanna just I just wanna hang with everybody. That's the only thing I'm thinking about is, man, I gotta pitch something that's that, that's up to snuff with these people around. And you have you have a lot of experience doing, of course, writing for TV with the the sketches that you would do for for SNL. But obviously, it's a different type of process doing a whole TV series and working with a, a group of writers. What would you say are kind of the main things you you learned doing this process? Uh, well, the biggest thing is just, um, uh, and, 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 you know, this, this is something I learned a lot at, at uh, Pixar where I was for a little while. It's like, you, you gotta let the story kind of be what it wants to be and you can't shoehorn things in there. Um, I've, I've written novels before. Novels, you kind of can shoehorn things in. Like some of my favorite funny novels are incredibly digressive. And go all over the place, like you know, it's, it's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and it's not like the most narratively, co- you know, coherent book. Uh, or you know, you read something like, uh, you know, obviously like any anything by uh, Roald Dahl, you know, or Joseph Heller, it kind of goes all over the place. Um, right. But with like a with a sitcom or with a film, you really got to stay on story. You can't have any fat. You can't really digress. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things we have in our, you know, writer's room is like, you know, no digressions. Uh, and do, do you ever feel like, I mean, so, so obviously you had a lot of, uh, funny guys working in the writing writer's room, uh, funny guys and, and women. And, uh, but you're already, you already wrote kind of like the skeletons of the stories or really you wrote the whole stories because it's, it's based on your collection. Um, what did you learn in terms of them helping you kind of even make these stories or the dialogue even funnier? Um, well, you know, it's a mix of, it. a lot of the premises are, are from the book, like, like all the premises in the pilot are obviously from the book, but, um, I would say probably at least 50% of the, 
kind of basic ideas that you'll see on the show uh, are not in the book, and, 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 and you know, were brainstormed by, by my writers. So uh, they, they're definitely, you know, in on the ground floor on most of the episodes. Um, and, you know, a lot of the episodes I didn't write. I, uh, of the ten I wrote or co-wrote, uh, I think six. So there's, you know, there's a full episode written by Sophia. There's a full episode written by Emacs and Graham wrote the finale. Um, and so there's a lot of episodes that, uh, you know, are not, are, I didn't even write. And so it's like, that's what's so thrilling about it is, uh, you know, it, it, it feels almost like a miracle when you, when, to, to make something and then have talented writers be willing to work on it. I, mean, I can't even tell you how gratifying it is. It's, it's, uh, writing the show is the best, the best experience of my life. And did you ever um, disagree with any of the decisions they made? Like, you know, when you, when you were looking over, let's say, one of the episodes you didn't write, did you ever say, no, the uh, the, the J character uh, has to be like this? Or Yeah, I mean, you know, you're always kind of figuring it out together, but it's, it's, it's way more collaborative than, um, you know, it's, it's not, it, I'm never like, a, <laughs> not a, at a podium lecturing people. It's, it's uh it's we're, we're all in it together and um and you know we do constant table reads you know we're constantly reading outlines and then scenes and then episodes out loud to each other over and over and over again um just to get it right and uh and what what, what are those reads like so so you get to work and everybody's in this room writing or or in their offices writing like what 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 happens like what's what's it what's a day like it varies based on like where we are in the process so you know, for the first couple of weeks, it's really just brainstorming ideas. And then there's a chunk of time spent, uh, you know, what we call breaking the stories, where we actually think, okay, what's the, you know, what are the order of events going to be? Um, and as we're doing that, we're thinking about, you know, our character arcs and like, what are these, what are these people, what's wrong with these people? It's basically as simple as like, what's wrong with these people? What do they keep doing wrong? What are they going to have to learn? And start to maybe hopefully do a little bit right. Um, and then you kind of, you know, where do we want these characters to start? Where do we want them to end up? And, and, and with, like, like in the in the Hitler pilot, uh, yeah, you know, what type of what are you thinking? Like, what what changes between that between the TV episode and the short story? Um, well, a ton, right? Because the 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 uh, the, the stories are really just scenes. Right. And, um, and so they don't really, stories don't, necess- don't really need, something big needs to happen and a big change needs to take place, but a character doesn't actually need to necessarily grow as much. A story can kind of end with a character realizing something about themselves or facing a truth, you know, that, that, that they, they've been hiding from. Um, it can be a pretty subtle change, but, but with a, a piece of like scripted television, you want the change to be a little bit bigger. You want it to be, you know, more of a more of a proper arc. It's just more satisfying. So, like in the pilot, um, Jay's really bad at you know he's really a, a nervous and afraid to uh, talk to women, and in the end, he he manages to get a girl's number on the train, which is a for him a big achievement. And you know, it's it's such a big achievement that in the world of the show that he he wins a MacArthur Genius Grant for his uh, for his efforts and gets a congratulatory phone call from the president of the United States. Because that's how excited he feels, you know, that he's actually overcome this this fear and and uh, sucked it up and, and taken a risk. That, that, that's funny because it's it's it always seems like, and this is true for your for your stories, and it sounds like it's true true for the TV series. You take this premise, which is very stressful, like it's hard for a guy to ask uh, a woman for her phone number, and yeah. then you you kind of come up with the most extreme, outlandish. Uh, you know, outcomes of that, like the president of the United States calls him and he wins a genius award. So, yeah. you know, um, was that? That's it. That's my whole gimmick. That, <laughs> Anyone can do it. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you about that. But, <laughs> but but does, so that works well, obviously in stories, and I'm sure it works well in in TV. But uh, was it hard, kind of taking the, this these absurdist kind of concepts, like oh, his ex girlfriend's going out with Hitler, and translating that to TV? Like, is there ever a moment where you're afraid you're going to lose the um, viewer because it's too absurd? Um, I mean, you know that that's sort of the uh, that's a really good question. I mean, the uh, you're, you're, if, if you're in danger of losing the viewer, it means that at some point you, in my book, it means at some point you've taken a wrong turn. 
you know, if it if it if it isn't relatable, if it isn't grounded, if it isn't universal, uh, then you kind of you've lost at some point. You know, uh, everything in the show. It's my hope that everyone watching it will be able to say, "Oh yeah, you know, I've been there." Yeah, well, I like and how. And if they're not, you know, if, if it doesn't uh, produce that reaction in the viewer, then it's a failed premise. Well, in the in the clip I saw, because I saw watched one of the clips they released was the Hitler clip, and um, uh, I like how it gets grounded very quickly with a lot of dialogue. Like you know, she's seeing somebody, so it's dialogue that would be exactly. natural with with oh, your ex girlfriend seeing somebody and he's here, and then it's intermixed with kind of the absurdist elements. Even though oh, there's totally. and like in the troll example, a clip that was released. Um, She's a troll, which is absurdist, but then there's this brought down to reality, like, hey, uh, you know, you're not so hot yourself. So, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I like how, so, so I'm, I'm figuring out the Simon Rich technique uh, as I go along yeah, with this. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it's not like I invented it. I mean, that's, that's been a hallmark of absurdist theater for decades. And, and uh, you know, it's like, uh, that's sort of the thrill of it is, is how do you juxtapose uh, naturalism and, and, and realistic dialogue alongside uh, major supernatural elements. So so along the way with all of this, you've had like a very, I would almost say, traditional route. Like you you, you um, wrote for SNL. You have in- incredibly funny books. It's like four collections of, of stories, two novels. Uh, you you uh, now you're going to be working on these movies. You're working on this TV show. It's like this incredible career. If someone was just starting out, what recommendations would you have for them? Like, let's say someone's working like a cubicle job at Procter and Gamble, but really secretly wants to be a sitcom writer. What should they do? Um, gosh, you know, I, I would say, uh, how, how would they get your eye? You know, like for, let's say you're, you're hiring writers for the next season. How would yeah, they, yeah. Uh, well, the, the writers I hired, you know, they came from, like, a, a lot of different backgrounds. Um, I didn't read any spec scripts. You know, I didn't read any versions of other people's scripts. I'll tell you that. I didn't read any, like, you know, here's how I would write a Parks and Rec. Um, I read only original uh, pieces. Oh, um, like, but, uh, like know, dialogue pieces, like screenplay style? I read, I read, I read uh, plays. I read uh, articles. I read short stories. I read original pilots, I read original screenplays, um, I watched stand-up comedy, I looked everywhere, you know, and, and uh, I just picked the, the writers I thought were best, regardless of what genre they were working on, regardless of what medium they had written in, and just hired them. Like, like the Onion guy, was? did you yeah. just call him cold, like, hey, I love your stuff at the Onion, and can you come work on this show? He'd written a play, actually, Dan Merck, uh, which I read which uh, is unbelievably funny. Um, I'm near a laptop. I'm going to look it up so I can tell everybody listening on the radio to, to check it out. Um, <laughs> uh, it's called... Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I think it's called A Man With an Umbrella Stuck Through His Head. A, a Man and With an Umbrella Stuck Through His Head. I'm pretty sure that's what it was called. Uh, but it's a hilarious play by Dan Merck. And... Um, it's just about a guy with a, who had an accident where a, uh, a brightly colored umbrella stabbed him through the eyeball and he's in a hospital, you know, ER kind of slowly dying. But as he's dying, uh, of this terrible misfortune, he sort of gradually becomes an internet celebrity because, uh, <laughs> cause it's pretty funny looking. Huh. And, um, it's about his, uh, simultaneous ascent to the top of the, uh, media sphere, uh, and, and descent into, into death. <laughs> And this is incredibly funny. But what I loved about it is, you know, it's everything I love. It was a juxtaposition of, of you know, an extremely high stakes, violent, absurdist premise with perfectly written natural dialogue. And how did how did he get his play into your hands? Like, how did you see the play? Um, he was repped by CAA. I so see. I, you know, I, he he was in the mountain of. You know, when you when you when you have a new show, every every agency on earth sends you like you know a hundred scripts, and you just get this pile of it. You know, you can't believe the size of it, and you just you know it was it was a, it was a long time. It was like a couple of months reading. I remember thinking, you know, it'd be faster for me to just write all these episodes myself than to uh, than to read all of this. But now 
looking back, I'm so happy that I did because I found these incredible all stars and their episodes are better than mine. So I'm really, you know, really grateful that I, I, uh, that I found them and, and happy that I took the time to read well, all that stuff. Who told you that you, that you couldn't do that? That you couldn't, mm-hmm. who told you that you couldn't just write all the episodes yourself? I knew, I mean, I knew in the back of my mind, like just from experience, you want to be, you, you want to be, uh, surrounded by talented people you know they, they push you to work harder and, and you learn from them and everybody has different skills you know if you have five great writers in a room they're not all going to be good at the same things um you just want you, you want you want as more smart people around as possible i mean it's just common sense i uh uh ian maxwell graham he had this quote that he told me where he, he said that um uh, if you're ever in a situation where you look around and you feel like you're the funniest, smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Uh, that's and a good you, quote. You, you need to get to a better room. You want to feel like you're barely holding up. And so I've always tried to you know, seek out rooms like that where, you know, where I feel like, man, I better not blow it here. Well, and uh, so, so were, were there any writers that you pursued that rejected you, that you really wanted, that rejected going, you know, working for the show? Um, yeah, we, I mean, we couldn't, we, we couldn't get everybody we wanted, um, because, um, you know, we're a small cable show and, uh, we, we only had so many slots that we, you know, that, that we had the budget for. And that's, you know, there's a lot of great writers out there and you can't hire all of them. And that's part. So, so, okay. So for, for someone wanting to like, let's say break into comedy, what are, what are three, and this is kind of like a, a very basic question, but what are like three tips you would get for writers that you would give? Like just the basic three. Well, I would, I would, I would, uh, just make something great and not worry about like whether or not it fits into any kind of economic landscape. You know, nobody told Dan Merck to go write, you know, to go write an, umbre- uh, an umbrella through somebody's brain play, you know, right. he just wrote it because he wanted to write it and it was great. And, you know, it, it was put up in some tiny theater and the script made the rounds and then he got a TV job. You know, well, it's, it, he well, didn't like he set out to get a TV job. He'd made something great and then somebody found it. So I would say just make something great, whether that's like a great 10 minutes of stand up comedy or a short play that you're going to write and put on with your friends at a small theater or. I mean, the, the fastest route is to create a great thing and stick it online. That's the, that seems to be like the way to, to get there right now. If, if I were young and starting out, the only thing I would do is make internet videos all day long. That, that's funny. So like what, what would be an example that you might consider for an internet video? Really, any of the c- clips that I saw uh, from, from Man Seeking Woman would, would be good as, as internet videos as well. Thanks. Yeah, I hope so. I hope they, you know, you never know with those things. You always hope that they somehow like uh, hit a nerve. I've never been good at predicting what what is and what isn't, though. Well, what's interesting is it reminds me of like how uh, the you know Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show is very YouTubeable. Like you could kind of take different segments and easily put them on YouTube, and they and they stand alone. It seems like a lot of the segments in the show, and I don't know this because I haven't because obviously the episodes aren't out yet. But it seems like there's standalone clips within the show that are very YouTubeable. Thanks. Yeah, that's the hope. You know, that's, that's sort of my dream is like that it's kind of not to get too pretentious, but, uh, you know, that it's sort of like a Russian nesting doll where it, it works on a scene by scene level, but then it also works, you know, the, on an episode to episode level. And then it also works on a season to season level. So, you, you know, you have standalone set pieces, but then every episode has a, has a, you know, has a narrative and then also the seasons. Have a, have a larger narrative. So that's been, that's been the goal. You know, I'm, I'm not sure we a hundred percent pulled it off, but that's, that's definitely what we're going for. And, and how will you know, like, how will you, how will you judge your success on this? Like how many, is there a certain like millions, number of millions that have to watch it? Or when do you find out if you're like on the uh, renewed for a second season, the whole thing? Um, I don't know when we find out about that, you know, and it's, it's yeah, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous because it, you know, it is a really strange show. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's strange, but you know, all, all of those FXX shows, uh, have some elements of absurdism, uh, like, you know, from Louie to it's always sunny and, and everything, but yours, yours definitely takes it to a new level. 
It seems. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty out there. So, you know, I, I, it's, I just feel, uh, really grateful that they let us do it. And, um, no matter what happens, like, I'm, like, overjoyed that this, these 10 episodes are gonna exist in the world, you know, that we're gonna have this, uh, 220 minutes of, uh, of content, you know, that, that we got to make. And I'm really proud of it and just grateful and thankful that we got to do it. And, um, so, I'm trying to just focus on that. You know, the the, the reason why it's nerve wracking is because it was so much fun, and I want to make more. You know, that's that, and it, it it was really my dream job. You know, it, it also my it, it was the best year of my life. And so, you know, obviously, I'm, I'd love to have another year like it. But, of course. but uh, at this point, it's kind of out of my hands. So I'm just kind of trying to be uh, grateful that I got a year like this. But now, now, what's next though? Is you, you're working with uh, Seth Seth Rogen on the the first movie, and then I think Jason Reitman you're working with on Elliot Allagash as a movie. Yeah, I'm working on a lot of different movies, and you know, a lot of different uh, stories, and I'm always working on a book or two. Um, and uh, yeah, just kind of, I've got a list of projects that I'm always working on. And, uh, so is Seth I try, Rogen? I try to do a lot of different things at once, you know, to try to keep busy. Are, are Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg actively involved in the writing process on the movie, or have they kind of like bought the writing process for the movie? Are you not involved with that? Uh, say it again. I'm sorry. Are they? It, it, are Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg? Are they actively involved in the writing process of the movie? Um, I mean, you know, I'm the writer, so so I I write the drafts, but they're they're um. They're, we're all executive producers, so uh, after each draft, we all read it, we all sit down together, and we, you know, we all try to make it better. And, and uh, their notes have been excellent. I think that every, you know, they're they're extremely smart. They're obviously incredibly funny. They well, really get movies, and and uh, their, well, their what, notes have been fantastic. What's an example? The draft. What's an example note where you wrote you wrote a scene, you got the note from one of them, and it was just funnier than what you had? Oh, I mean, I, it's hard because I don't want to give any, give away anything about the uh, about about an in progress screenplay. But right. uh, you know, they're always they're 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 great at jokes, of course. But it's when when you're doing a movie, the jokes are almost like secondary or even tertiary concern. I mean, the biggest thing with a movie is. Is the story working? Are the characters moving in the right direction? Is the pacing right? Is it high enough stakes? You know, those are the only things you're really thinking about. The actual like jokes and like one-liners, uh, those kind of come along the way. But you can't you can't really build a, build a movie on jokes. The only thing you can really build on jokes is like a stand-up comedy routine or sometimes a sketch. But even a sketch built around jokes often doesn't work. You know, like, really, it's opening monologues on talk shows is really where, where straight-ahead jokes are king. Everywhere else, they're kind of secondary. Well, well, it's interesting because with the three tips for writers, you started off with the first tip saying, you know, write something great. Don't think about kind of the economic landscape. But you've mentioned also this concept of, of high stakes. And so setting aside the, the, the aspect of, you know, high stakes combined with jokes, what are like, uh, you know, uh, what for you qualifies as a high stakes premise? Um, you know, it's, it's pretty subjective, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's like saying like what, what, you know, uh, because, uh, it's all about execution to a certain extent, right? Like, um, say it's, uh, uh, you know, is a is a um, um, is a is a is a little boy going to uh, be able to save an alien from some doctors? I mean, like, is that high stakes? Like, how can you tell? Like, I, if you got if you got that on a piece of paper and read it, you'd be like, I don't know. But then when you watch ET, you're like, whoa, nothing can be higher stakes, you know, than whether or not Elliot saves this creature. You know, my 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 heart and soul are racing. I hope to God that that he pulls it off. You know, so. So a lot of it is in is in the execution. Um, it's never a good idea to like say an idea is definitely going to work or definitely not going to work when you know uh, uh, you never really know until you try it out to a certain extent. But I think you know for me, I'm always trying to uh, 
for me, it's always like the, the definition of whether or not it's high stakes is like, is it emotionally visceral? Like, you know, is it, does this tap into like a, an extreme feeling like fear or, or you know, loss or, or, you know. Or yeah, because it seems like if you can tap into that, then you allow yourself to get as absurd as possible with it. Like as long as yeah. you're tapping into a real feeling, then you just run with it. Yeah, exactly. So that's, you know, E.T. I mean, you know, one of the, one of the great movies of all time, it's, you know, it's about friendship and about the, being an outsider and loneliness. And then, you know, these, these are incredibly visceral, universal emotions. And, and, you know, and then, yeah, it's also about an alien. But, you know, <laughs> at its core, it's obviously about something very simple and very human. And how was it, um, working with Jay Baruchel on the show? Oh man, it was the best. That guy is so good. Like the, he was so good. I couldn't, I couldn't believe how, how, I mean, I knew he was funny and I had been a fan of his for years, but, uh, talk about grounding, you know, a show. He, he played everything so naturalistically, uh, so relatably. He was just, he was just killer throughout. And, and also, you know, just like on a professional level, just a really, like, talent aside, like, it's a really good sport. I mean, we, we put this guy through hell on this show. I mean, we set him on fire. We, you know, we cut off his arms. I mean, really, like, we, we he had to, you know, fight an alien overlord, you know, wearing nothing but a, uh, but like a, a pair of like, you know, of tight underwear. I mean, he's been, he's been through hell and back for us and he never complained. He was always just like, yeah, cool. Like, bring it on. So, uh. That's great. So, on a uh, creative and professional level, he was awesome. And of course, he was playing you, basically. Well, I mean, <laughs> I like to think, I mean, it, it's my hope that he was playing, you know, uh, uh, you know, a specific character, but I, my hope is that um, the stories in the, in, in the show are universal enough that so, everyone will see, everyone will see themselves in it. That's the, that's the hope is that. Everyone watching will be like, "Oh yeah, I've, I've been there." So, so three. Just, just to just to close this off, because uh, I know you're 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 a busy guy. Uh, Man seeking woman is airs tonight, uh, 10:30 p.m. FXX. Uh, it's the pilot, so I'm really excited to watch it. What are what are the final? What are three things you would recommend reading or watching? that kind of um, sort of inspired you as you were writing this, the collection of stories in the series? Oh, cool. Good question. Um, I would say uh, The Adventures of Pete and Pete. I don't know that awesome. one. What is that? Awesome, uh, absurdist uh, children's sitcom. It was uh, on Nickelodeon in the 90s. It, it, extremely funny and uh, moving and uh, very... Uh, very bold. I'm going to uh, check that out. The yeah, Adventures, Adventures of Pete and Pete. Pete. The Adventures of Pete and Pete. Great show. Um, I would say uh, um, anything by Kurt Vonnegut, you know, just the way he, he blends uh, high stakes realism with, uh, you know, science fiction and horror and, and all these other genres. I, I think that He's about as funny and, and interesting a writer out there. I, I just, then, I just, just to, to mention, I just finished rereading um, Breakfast of Champions, and I had forgotten uh, how absurdist it was. Like, and I, I thought it was really great. Oh, it's great! And God bless you, Mister Rosewater. And yeah, um, yeah, I just think that I think he's the best, maybe. And then I would say, you know, I got to go with uh, Kids in the Hall, you know, which. Is is my favorite sketch show of all time. Even though we're not a sketch show and we're we're a sitcom, you know, I think we all of us in the room were incredibly inspired by the the kind of tone and boldness of that of that show. And um and we got to we got to bring in Mark McKinney. And Mark McKinney is a, a series regular. He plays uh, uh, Jay's stepdad, so uh, or the man who is dating Jay's mother, uh, Tom. So yeah, so we got to work with Mark McKinney, which was a total dream come true. Well, uh, Simon, good luck. Uh, hopefully, um, you could come back for the uh, when when the second season starts as well. Hey, man, yeah, knock on wood. If if we make it, I'll be there. Excellent. Well, well, good luck tonight, and uh, I will talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye. 
For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.